Knowledge is power, and this is powerful stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with your hosts, Michael McCollum and Jen Solis. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. The phone lines are open at 731-1230. That's 731-1230 or toll free. Toll free. 1-866-820. 055528. That's 1-866-820-KLAV. Now, let's bring on the hosts. Here is Michael McCollum and Jen Solis. Good afternoon. This is Michael McCollum. I'm Jennifer Solis. And welcome to another edition of the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, where we bring you the latest news and information on this emerging billion-dollar industry in Nevada and beyond. Well, let's let's start talking quickly uh, about uh, just this morning, Jen. You and I uh, wound up in the Nye County Commission office out in Pahrump, where the Board of County Commissioners was entertaining debate on whether to move forward with their regulations. What was your take of this meeting? Oh, what a cluster cluck that was! With, without a doubt. Uh, it, it was really interesting. We, we were there at the uh, the request and, and the invite of one of the county commissioners uh, who thought that, uh, who is a strong supporter of the Constitution and, and the bill that came out of it, and he thought that this was going to move forward, but there was some opposition by uh, a couple of other uh, county members and Well, some what people. it kind of seemed like to me was that they were all growers and patients and that they were supplying Perump and they, they, they didn't want their cash cow cut off. They don't want the competition. Um, I, I think that's not an unfair assessment. Uh, from what I saw there, the biggest issue that was uh, preventing this, th- this ordinance from passing today was that people were afraid that when the dispensary, the sole dispensary in Nye County opens, and if it opened in Pahrump, that people would be inside a 25-mile limit and would lose their ability to grow their own meds. And you know, Jen, that this has been a big problem here in Las Vegas, it and has. we had to fight against that last year with our patients sta- statewide who were uh, afraid of that very provision in the law. It was. It was like we were fighting. We were fighting the uneducated uh, politicians on one side, and then the uneducated public on the other, and and both trying to tell them, "Hey, listen, this doesn't mean that you're you're going to have to quit growing unless you make over one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. It's a financial burden to buy five ounces a month at four hundred dollars an ounce. Absolutely, it is. And so, uh, moving forward, uh, we 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 believe because we had to leave the the commission meeting early in order to get back here to do the show. Uh, it did not. Li- seem like they were going to have any sort of resolution on this issue today. No, it didn't. It, did, it seemed like that there was going to be a, a bunch more argument and that maybe that they were going to come back, you know, in a couple of days or a week or wh- whenever their sessions sit and, and discuss it again. Yes. Uh, fortunately, tomorrow uh, we're hoping to have a little uh, different result or a significantly different result in the county commission. And we would uh, ask any of our interested listeners to come down to the county commission office at 500 Grand Central Parkway and put in your two cents. We're having a public hearing tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. And the, it's, the item is like number 62 or yeah, 65. I mean, with- it, won't be, it won't be first thing in the morning, but get down there. Well, get down there and and fill out an interest card that you would like to speak upon this matter. And then I think that it's going to be heard closer to noon or maybe one. And then we've got a city meeting following up uh, the county commission meeting. The Las Vegas City Council is meeting at one o'clock and they are also uh, putting this on the agenda somewhat late in the schedule. Uh, However, with the city, if you want to go to that one, you would be best advised to get there right at the start of the meeting to get your public comments in at the very beginning in case the mayor once again decides to shut down public comment later on and and not allow it uh, as we saw back in September. So we have these two meetings tomorrow and we do expect that the county is going to move forward with this ordinance and uh, begin this process. Now, I had a conversation just this morning with Jackie Holloway, Director of Business Licensing, and she is predicting that the window for applications on the county level is going to open somewhere between February 2nd, uh, pardon me, April 2nd and April 12th 
for a 14-day window. And once that window closes and they are looking at these applications, uh, Jackie is saying that it's going to be about 30 days before they're ready to take that out to the county commission and you start having hearings on that. And this is all predicated on them passing this tomorrow, but we believe they will. There was a town hall meeting last Wednesday, uh, which uh, I attended and, and several of us here in the studio did. And we see that uh, our county commissioners are, are definitely committed to moving forward. Uh, we also think on that uh, tone that the city council is very likely to move forward in this area. I believe that I, I believe that's correct. All Actually. right. So that's uh, the latest up to the minute news. And we will be uh, moving from our original format into more of what we did last week, because this time I'm surrounded by a bevy of lovely ladies here in Las Vegas. And nobody's wearing plumes, so I know they're not showgirls. But we have here next to me, of course, is, is Jen Solis. We have uh, Michelle Fiore, who is an assemblywoman, uh, for, who was the sole uh, Republican to, to vote for uh, the SB. 374 Medical Cannabis Reform Bill. Uh, we have Victoria Seaman, who is hoping to join Michelle in the Assembly this session. And we have Ariel Clark, an attorney from Southern California who is working in multiple states, including Nevada, uh, advising, uh, advising clients on how to open medical cannabis businesses. So, welcome, ladies. Welcome, ladies. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. It is our pleasure. So let's see, Michelle, you're a business owner. You're an I ar- am. You're an I am. ardent Second Amendment supporter. Yes. And you're a first-term member of the uh, Nevada Assembly. I am. And now you're on the campaign trail for re-election. And uh, I, I hear you have a primary opponent, so I you're going to be fighting. I do. I have a, I, well, as of today, I do. Um, and uh, that that will be quite interesting. Well, I I I think that he better run for the hills because it's you know a you're oh, it's a chick. <laughs> it's a chick. Oh, oh. Okay, well <laughs> that's all right. But you're from Brooklyn, right? You're I am. Tough. So she, I'm, I'm from Staten Island, good good with so I know you guys are. Tough. <laughs> I don't know. She's. I'm not going to make any comment about it right now. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Fair you enough. know, and and I, I hear that that part of the reason that you're getting this is that it was your vote uh, for uh, passage of the medical cannabis reform bill uh, you know it was a crucial vote you were the only assembly Republican to cross the aisle although a number of, of Senate Republicans supported the bill uh, yet uh, because of this um, you're getting a primary challenge it's the truth and one of the things I don't think that people understand is number one the division between church and state and number two I am the voice of the people not my religion and not just my choice so Medical marijuana has been on the ballot twice. We should have had dispensaries up, going, flourishing. We would have, you know, no tax issue. We wouldn't be putting a lot of the tax burdens on the backs of businesses because we do have, you know, an income issue here in the state of Nevada with as far as taxation. So 2000, 2012, it passes ballot and not, you know, 70 something percent and the legislature doesn't implement it. So now my freshman year, I get to take part in implementing something that the constituents, the Nevadans, have asked for for over a decade. And I just think that my fellow peers and the fellow elected officials and the candidates running need to understand that that seat is not Michelle Fiore's seat. That seat is the people's seat. And when the people speak on a ballot, that's what we implement. Amen, Amen, sister. You know, I, and I've been saying that for for a long time. Uh, and the the fact that when we have we have a representative democracy and we vote people in to represent us and represent our views, but too often we see once they are elected, they are either representing corporate views or they are representing their own moral positions and forgetting why we voted them in in the first place. Well, not only their own moral positions, but their own agenda. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. And I will tell you, on this particular bill, um, you know, it was written by Senator Tick Sigerbloom, and a lot of people think Tick and I are on the opposite ends of the spectrum, which, you know, a c- policy, yes, but as an individual, he, you know, he's a pretty cool guy. I mean, did you look at his fundraiser? His, his bottom line was a bud tender. I mean, it was And hysterical. the top line is a space cowboy. It's a space cowboy. Space cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, you, you talk about, um, you know, and Goff, a bit of a Republican, never had a, uh, a thing like that. It would just go crazy but why is that you know um 
uh, I mean, gosh, Republicans get. Well, well, <laughs> well, do you do you that, think that's that the Republicans? Right. We're just friends here. Yeah, it's the right, four right. Of us no talking. one's listening. <laughs> pay, pay, pay no attention to the big right, black right. thing in front of your um, face. You know, the issue is it's again it goes back to the people. The bill SB three seventy four. We are going to be amending it and fixing it to make sure that all the constituents are covered, um, because. A lot of times when people say, oh, you know, we work great with, you know, our peers. No, sometimes they don't. And sometimes, unfortunately, it is true that votes will come down party line versus for the people. And none of my votes this session, and I'm very proud to say I was elected the number one or rated the number one legislator by the NPRI. None of my votes came down to my party saying, hey, Michelle, let's vote no on this because we can kill a Democrat bill. I've heard that before, and I've said, yeah, no. There's, you know, 58 bills that require a two-thirds vote in this past session that we could have saved the constituents' tax dollars. But no one no one would – we couldn't be the mean 15 and say no on dollar issues, but all of a sudden, you know, they want to form together and, and be the mean 15 on a Democrat bill. Well, that's not going to fly with me, period. If the bill is good and if it's the bill is what the people want, then they – then. I am their voice. I'm not my voice, nor am I my caucus's voice. Did you get a lot of grief from your caucus about this? Oh, a lot? I think that's an understatement. Really? You know, <laughs> it, 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 just, it just amazes me. And, and in talking with uh, Michael McDonald the other night, uh, he was like, well, my job is to bring these people along. And my, my job is to make these Republicans understand that this, it, it's not a social issue. It's a health issue. Mm-hmm. And so we're, we're hoping that that's going to move forward. So, Victoria, you're currently working as a real estate agent. You've got a very diverse business background. Now you're running for the assembly. You know, uh, you, wrote, you boast a record of successful entrepreneurship. You have a platform I read on your website that includes jobs, education, and housing. I don't see anything about medical cannabis, so are you going <laughs> to be up here uh, uh, standing next to Michelle and, and be in support, or are you going to be part of that, what, what is that, that negative, that, that fearsome 15 or something like that? Uh, or, <laughs> the mean 15. No, I, actually, mean? No, I actually um, think that the bill was a good bill. It's what the people wanted. Mm-hmm. I also agree with Michelle that it's not the legislator's seat. It's the people's seat. And uh, there are far more what I mean, there are very harmful drugs on the market. And I don't see medical marijuana being as harmful as other drugs. Plus, I've seen um, different patients that it's actually worked for. So I'm in support of medical marijuana. But my big issue is hemp. Mm-hmm. Oh, Why is yeah. hemp outlawed? Hemp is, uh, we're importing it from other countries and we could be creating jobs. Currently it's imported from China. It's a hemp bamboo blend or hemp cotton blend is currently imported from China. If we could just, we could grow that here in America and have and have the production facilities to make that into clothing or whatever else we need, that, that would create We'd so many jobs. We'd have a booming economy. So um, that's really my big issue, and we've got to do something about that. You Michelle? Know, and I want to just make sure that our listeners understand the difference between hemp and medical marijuana. You can't smoke a 1,000 pounds of hemp and get the effects that you would with medical marijuana. It's a whole different product. It's actually a product that, you know, our President Nixon had signed away uh, – back in the day and gave it to China and now we need to get it back. It's a it's a fabulous crop. It creates jobs. It's great for America. So hemp, you know, and I would like to make some hemp clothing. Yes. Yeah. Well, let sure. me put this out to both of you ladies then. I mean, you've got people like uh, Mitch McConnell and Rand Paul who are both voicing support for industrial hemp. Uh, we have the ma- majority of the country polling for general legalization and a clear supermajority supports medical cannabis. Why do you think that there's still such entrenched opposition to this issue, at least federally? Education. I think the people really need to be educated on what hemp. Is it the people or is it the politicians? And the politicians, absolutely. Well, I think the people need to be educated on what politicians to elect out of office. Oh, amen. <laughs> oh, I like that. Yeah, All right. Well, you know. The voice of reason for Michelle um, Fiore. <laughs> So, Ariel, you are, uh, you're an active member of the California State Bar, uh, the Beverly Hills Bar Association, the National Lawyers Guild, and uh, National and California Normal Legal Committees. And Normal uh, is, of course, the, Nas- the National Org- Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Uh, you, uh, you hail most recently from the Bay Area, and you're part of a progressive civil rights community uh, where the medical marijuana movement remains on the cutting edge. Uh, 
uh, your your experience in ongoing legalization and regulation of medical cannabis, uh, among other civil and political issues. You've got clients in Washington, in Arizona, and for several years now, I guess, in, in Nevada. Um, how do you see the, the program starting to unfold? We've just had the release of the regulations a couple hours ago. Yes, indeed. Well, the program in Nevada is very exciting. Um, You know, here we are situated kind of in the historical progression of this movement and this industry, and we are 20 states into medical marijuana, two states into marijuana for profit. Um, Nevada is very exciting because the regulations and the bill itself is very detailed in terms of being robust regulations and a very detailed, comprehensive program that will certainly benefit all folks here in terms of the patients who need it, as well as from monies that will be generated from all of the revenue. So um, it is quickly coming online, as you mentioned, everything that's happening with regard to the municipalities, as well as the statewide regulations being effective April 1st. Yeah, and at the Nye County meeting this morning, uh, the point was brought up that if the counties don't go and regulate uh, their zoning requirements and their business licensing requirements, then anybody is just going to be able to go to the state, apply for a license, and uh, and open up shop. And so it means that these counties can't just stick their head in the sand. They, they have to address these issues. And certainly it behooves the counties to do so because you want to know what businesses are in your localities. Um, and that also provides an opportunity for those individuals who are residents of those cities and counties to speak and, you know, have voice to increase Create the program in their local area. And again, you know, to underscore the importance of patients having access to this medical marijuana, um, to the revenue that will be generated in so many ways to the employment and um, all of that from from a implementation of this industry. It just benefits everyone. And very much it's like school board control. You want it at a local level rather than having far-off bureaucrats determine what you want to do. And we've seen a lot of great things. I mean, the other evening um, you had mentioned um, the open forum with uh, the county commissioners in Clark County. It was a wonderful coming together of community folks. You had a couple of commissioners, Commissioner Weekly, um, Commissioner Gunciliani, and some people from the Business License Office Planning Department. A colleague of mine, Jay Matos, was there as well, really explaining to the community, here is what this industry you looks like. somebody. Oh, and you, Michael, of course, <laughs> I'm looking at you. <laughs> All right. Well, let, let, me, let me just uh, stop it there. We're going to take a, a brief break. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Come out and join us April 4th for Nevada Medical Cannabis Symposium 4, NCMS4. That's April 4th at Main Street Station. Look on our website, www.wecan702.org or www.wecan702.com for details. This symposium is going to help you with your final draft regulations and also to get any people that you may need for your application. So make sure to join us on April 4th at the Main Street Station in the Roundhouse. You can find information at www.wecan702.org. Go to the top of the page and click on Symposium. That will take you to a direct link to register. Cannabis has been used as a healing medicine for over 5,000 years with no toxic side effects. Is it right for you? The professionals at Dr. Reefer are here to help. Now accepting new patients, make an appointment today at 428-0000. Bring your medical records, or if you don't have them, their staff will work to document your qualifying condition with a 99% approval rate. If you have any of the following conditions, cancer, AIDS, muscle spasm diseases, severe nausea, severe pain, Crohn's disease, glaucoma, or PTSD, call Dr. Reefer today for your free consultation and their money-back guarantee. If you don't qualify, you don't pay. Call 702-428-0000 to get your Nevada medical marijuana card today. We are honoring Jack Herrera as our 420 moment. Jack was never an elected official and he could never shape formally shape policy. Jack wrote the 
the emperor, emperor wears, wears no, no clothing. Clothes. Yeah. And he, um, everybody is aware of who Jack is, except if you're just a Johnny come lately into the cannabis culture. Jack not only fought for cannabis, but he fought for hemp legalization throughout America. He believed that it would save America and that it would save the planet. Here's our 420 moment to Jack Herrera. All right. Well, well, let's get back to talking about uh, that town hall meeting uh, last week. Um, I, I, too, thought it was a watershed moment because having, um, having a, a county take this discussion to this point and taking it to an informal level where, where when you're having a county commission meeting, you've only got three minutes and they're all watching the clock. Okay, is he done yet? Is he done yet? But here's something where they were taking questions, providing detailed answers, opening up some of the regulatory staff. And by bringing in uh, a political consultant and by bringing in an activist in the community shows how far we have come both as a as a movement, uh, we can as an organization that uh, we are being given equal voice in these halls of power. Finally, after all these years, I mean, we're and none of us is, is ever try is saying, well, you should go out and smoke pot. No, not at all. But we're saying, if somebody is sick, if somebody has a chronic and debilitating medical condition, cannabis should not be ruled out as a pharmaceutical as a as a as a treatment of choice. And so I think that our county officials there were, were the ones who got the real education, although they were there to an- answer questions for patients. Uh, the, the patients who were asking the questions and some of the answers that, that were provided were as enlightening to people like Commissioner Weekly as they were to anyone else in the audience. Absolutely. I have to, if I may say, really applaud um, all of you and the commissioners and the community in terms of coming together in that sort of forum. You know, I've been practicing law in this area for five, six, seven years. I don't know at this point how long. Um, But, you know, I haven't seen that sort of a community forum in most places in California and most places in other states. Again, now, thankfully, you know, we have an entire country that is understanding all the benefits of medical cannabis on so many different levels. And our societal attitude is changing with regard to medical marijuana as as well as recreational marijuana. Um, So we hopefully and I think we will continue to have more of those rational discussions where people are listening to each other and communicating as well across parties and other lines all right well uh, let me let me ask you then since your practice specializes in setting up and advising medical cannabis businesses um, we had a situation recently in the Las Vegas City Council where city uh, attorney uh, Brad Jerbic refused to consult to the city council and do his job quite frankly uh, because he was stating that any advice that he would give in this area would jeopardize his law license now obviously with the practice that you have you don't feel this way are, are you bold and reckless or or, are his fears unfounded? Well, actually, um, I I thought and researched for over a year as to whether I I would enter into this specific kind of counseling to medical marijuana business clients. Um, And in fact, at the time I did it, I was certainly on the cutting edge. Now I have a conversation with someone as to what my my expertise is. And people are much more amenable to that conversation, whereas even two, three, four, and certainly five and six years ago, um, uh, people were not so friendly to all of that. And I was concerned, am I conspiring to commit a federal crime by advising people as how to organize um, a medical marijuana business? But at this point, um, I am happy as ever to be involved in this, you know, this community and working for these clients who I love very much and care for very much and the patients that we serve um, and the business community that, you know, continues to grow. But, you know, with regard to uh, the inability for lawyers to advise as to the law that exists is indeed absurd because is not our job to translate the laws. And if we are unable to do that, who does that? Well, See, great. that's what I thought. I just thought he was a turd. Well, <laughs> well okay, that, that's one few. I can say um, that on the uh, air, can't I? I, I, I was just going to say, that maybe you'll consider moving to uh, Las Vegas, because if he doesn't want to do his job out there, maybe we can get you in as city attorney. Well, Ooh, I'm, I'm here half the time anyway, so. <laughs> there you go. Do you know of any instance where, wherein an attorney has been disbarred or disciplined, or any public official has been indicted for developing medical cannabis regulations? No, but certainly the federal government has 
have made um, certain threats. We know, for example, in the city of Oakland, um, and that uh, when the city attempted to issue four cultivation licenses, the federal government came in and said to the council people as well as the city attorney, look, if you issue these licenses, um, we are going to possibly come after you, and that's scary. Mm -hmm. Um, The only circumstances that I've heard lawyers being in any sort of trouble um, have been when those lawyers have acted beyond their professional license. Oh, outside of scope. Yes, indeed. And part of a continuing criminal enterprise. Yes, or something like and that. you know, for example, in California, profiting in a nonprofit state, um, mm-hmm. you know, holding monies and brokering deals. Um, this is not appropriate. All right, fair enough, Michelle. Let me switch gears for a minute here, and and. Uh, since I've got you here, and I, I, I know I know you're a big supporter of the Second Amendment, and and while I also I support the entire Constitution, I've got two questions for you. Okay. And and understand that um, uh, when I was 14, my dad was a conservationist. I w- underwent hunter safety training and and you know gun instruction, and all that sort of stuff. Okay. Now, given that the purpose of the of the Second Amendment was to maintain a ready militia in the days before the government had a standing army or police forces, is that still necessary? And also Given the argument that the amendment protects against governmental tyranny, won't the government always have more and bigger guns? Yes, it's just, um, and here is, here's my argument with that, and we're going to go back to Pearl Harbor and the reason why we weren't invaded. If you recall, um, when the captain went back to the emperor and said, we don't want to invade on land, inland in America, because behind every blade of grass, there's a rifle, meaning Americans are armed, period. So we aren't just armed to protect ourselves against our own government of tyranny, but we are armed as a force to protect our to protect ourselves against foreign enemies. So you just think, let's say Nevada gets attacked by, I don't know. Canada. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Not our friendly neighbor, Canada. But um, how many of us have firearms that will come to defend our families, our children, our cities, our states? So firearms, without a without a shadow of a doubt, uh, will not be taken away from me. They will either kill me or imprison me before I give any of my firearms up, and I'm dead serious about that. And, and that's the problem, though, that once they do imprison you, then they ban you from for, forever from, from having a firearm in this country. And unfortunately, we're in a situation where they, the government has gotten so big that they make so many laws that it's tough not to be in violation of one statute or another federal or state at any given point. And the, what you just said is so important because the people have to be educated on who they're putting in office. When you think about it, I'm sitting here having this common sense conversation with you when we, and I'm talking about Republican, conservatives, I'm, I'm the number one conservative in this state. We are sitting here talking about freedoms, okay? We fought against the uh, Affordable Care Act. We fought against Obamacare. Why? Because we wanted to choose our own doctors. We wanted to choose our own, we wanted to have our own choice on our medical decisions including our doctors. So now all of a sudden, we are fighting to choose the medicine that we take and the pharmaceuticals and the, and the law w- wants us to either be on heavy chemically engineered medical uh, pills, Oxycontin, morphine, all of these chemically engineered drugs I could have sitting in my purse in, in my firearm case. So, you know, and then all of a sudden here comes a plant that can't touch my gun. That's a problem. And, and part of the problem there is, is in having that plant anywhere near a gun, we see uh, instances all over the case where people who might have been uh, left, their cases slide or dismissed, if there was a gun around, they're not using the gun in an action of, uh, of a, a commission of a crime or anything. It might be locked away in a gun safe. Stored uh, somewhere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, and, and what happens is that because of that, uh, they get multiple indictments. Here on the state level, there's NRS uh, 202.360, unauthorized person in possession of a firearm. The, the, one of the conditions that you cannot have a firearm is if you're addicted to a control substance. And what happens is the the state, the charging authorities, say, well, if you have a medical cannabis card and you're a patient, then you're addicted to marijuana. And so, therefore, you shouldn't have a gun. And then they charge people with that felony. But understand, it's literally, they've found a little loophole to implement um, anti-gun agenda. So, Mm -hmm. they're giving you a choice. You either can have your medicine and no firearms because you can't have your medicine and your firearms to two constitutional rights 
that we have. Um, and that is not an agenda that I will follow. Um, you should have the choice to take what medicine you want, and you should never have your Second Amendment rights taken away, period. We are literally allowed to have, like I said, alcohol, um, whatever drug your doctor writes you, uh, and your firearm. So that it's just not okay. It, it seems that on the right that the Republicans want small, limited, stay-out-of-your-business government, except when it comes to what you put in your body and what you do in your bedroom. Whereas <laughs> Democrats want to, where Democrats want to uh, have a nanny state and take away your, your ability to protect yourself in a violent world. Where's the, where's the middle ground? Victoria, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree with you. <laughs> And um, as Michelle always says, you know, stay out of my boardroom in my bedroom. <laughs> That's good advice. Well, okay, yeah. the Republicans are listening to half and the Democrats are <laughs> listening to the other, other half. But, yes, and that's why you have to be careful who you elect because, you know, the government has no business in either one of those, your bedroom and your boardroom. And we should be able to make our own decisions as far as firearms and medicine. So I completely agree. And that's why, again, it's so important to research the candidates that you elect. And ask them questions. Ask them hard questions. Call them up. Email them. If, they, if they're not replying to you, then maybe it's someone that you don't want to vote for. Exactly. I found out that um, in politics, if you, ask, if you ask a politician a question and they say, you know, I'll get back with you about that. Or, you know, I'm, I'll have to research that. That generally means, you know, I, I really don't. I don't support what you have to say. But I don't want to say it here in a public forum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And that's that's one of my biggest problems is I kind of just say it like it is. So you either really well, like me or you really don't like me. <laughs> yeah. Well, we like you. We like you, Mr. <laughs> yes, but Mary. but uh, Ariel, let, let me ask if if you agree with that. Does the government need to stay out of the boardroom? I mean, you come from California where there was this little company uh used to be called Enron. So <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, I, I believe that we need to have government oversight when it comes to corporations and the boardroom to a certain extent. Just seeing all the abuses that we've seen with regard to big, big business, big corporation and the people to whom it affects. And I, I've got to agree as I see the, the medical cannabis industry developing in this state because as we're getting close to this application process, what we're seeing happen is a lot of big money and corporate interests are starting to get involved in this. And having worked this issue for 13 years and been very close to it and the patients, I don't see that solution and as necessarily being in the best interests of patients when, when they're putting bottom line profit before the very people with, without whom they wouldn't even have an industry. Well, this is also why your organization and our organization, We Can, is so very important because let, it, let us work all together so that we can act in terms of checks and balances. I very much appreciate Michelle and Victoria's perspective on things, and I am certainly open to listen to their perspective. I think a lot of also the problem comes in when people are unable to hear different sides of, of the aisle. That's true. That's true. When they only have one opinion and, and they only hear one view, you know, that's all that they're going to have uh, to reflect upon. So let me let me uh, go off into another area right now, and I, I mentioned this uh, a little bit oh, in the yeah. run up before the show. Uh, we have uh, in Pennsylvania, it's uh, the the uh, it's it's by Radley Balco, who is an excellent writer in in the Washington Post, uh, and he writes: County settles with mother who lost newborn after erroneous drug test, and uh, a woman who went into labor uh, in Pennsylvania, and just before she had went into labor, she had had dinner, including a pasta salad with poppy seeds. Uh, the blood test, the standard blood test that they do uh, uh, in the hospital revealed uh, that she had tested positive for opioids and they wound up taking her kid away. Uh, and so for the first 78 days of the child's life, the county had taken the kid away for 75 days. And, and so uh, she ultimately sued and, and uh, Lawrence County, Pennsylvania just settled her lawsuit for $160,000. Well, closer to home, we had a case of uh, the Ballad case uh, mm -hmm. where Federica's children were taken away from her and then all subsequent 
charges were dropped. And so now that the, she had to fight CPS to get her kids back when her case was dropped in the first place at the court, uh, you know, at the at the higher court, she had to fight CPS still. And she's still fighting CPS and she doesn't have her children back, but she has no charges. So I'd, I'd like all of you ladies to weigh in on, on this kind of situation. Not Michelle. okay. Reorganize. <laughs> Not okay, CPS. Reorganize. And I have to tell you, um, I have seen CPS in action myself. Um, I was a tip volunteer for quite a few years. And any time that there's an injured child, including the fatality of a child, CPS comes in, including infants. And 98% of the cases that the CPS actually investigated while I was uh, with the trauma intervention program, uh, turned up that it was either uh, SIDS syndrome with the child um, as an infant, but the SIDS meaning sudden infant death yes, syndrome, mm-hmm. which is largely unexplained. Yes, um, but but the um, the injury that's done to the mother who wants to just leave the earth anyway because she just lost her child is so psychologically damning damaging to where they literally make her hold a fake baby and they tell her how did you feed the baby and i've literally oh watched this it's really not okay so i think unfortunately that our division of uh of our um cps cps needs to be retrained and it's not only that, but but the judiciary as well, because it's shocking to me uh, how some of our uh, judges in this state, along with other law enforcement officials, uh, 13 years after the adoption of this program, are still unaware of the specifics of it. And judges routinely deny parents visitation or otherwise restrict them just because they're taking a, a state legal medicine and they're not abusing it. I remember I remember in this case because uh, Federica could not complete the state program that was oversaw, uh, overseen by the federal government. She couldn't test clean for medical cannabis because she's a medical cannabis patient. But the state test required her to test clean of everything or she couldn't get her kids back. And they were in the court arguing about this because hers is a state um, allowed medication. But the program that she had to take for the state was a federally funded program that said that had all these stipulations on it. So that's that's just a nut a nutty scenario in itself. So under what you just said is absolutely correct. Uh, in many of my hearings in the health committees, we would have agencies come in front of our our committee and say, "Listen, we have to um, amend." this NAC statue or this NRS statue, because if we don't, we're not going to get the 300,000 from the federal government to help with this program. So if we don't comply with Washington, D.C. being uh, the the instructor of Nevada, then we're not going to get the 300,000. So that that's the direction, unfortunately, that we see so many states um, complying with because the federal government just wants such a grip on all 50 states. And I really think that we as Nevada um, you know, need to uh, grow a set of shoulders and uh, yeah. and not move rely. forth. Yeah. Just not rely upon federal funding and say, you know what, we don't need your money, go. Well, we produce 85% of the nation's gold here. Well, so. uh, the other thing that, the other thing that we also... Uh, we're, we need to we're, tax it so we get that <laughs> revenue. <laughs> I think the reason that we can go 75 miles an hour on our freeways is that we're not taking federal money for our highways. So, Victoria, you're a mom. What do you think about the county taking kids away when there's no no abuse no i think they need to have more investigation better training and and more investigation before they can just rip a child out of a mother's arms it's i i am a mother and um i I just don't agree with um um not doing a better investigation okay ariel i I don't know whether you're a mom but you're an attorney so that's the next best thing what do you think (laughs) Well, I would agree with Michelle and with Victoria um, and only say that, unfortunately, this situation I have heard of and seen many times over the years across California and other states with people who are involved in medical marijuana, either, you know, involved in the cultivation or just use for various illnesses and having issues with CPS and their kids being taken away. And it's a shame. Do you think it's legitimate or do you think it's a a, a persecution? Oh, I I think it's an absolute persecution. All right. All right, well, we're going to take another break now, and we will be back in just a couple of minutes with our guests Michelle Fiore, Victoria Seaman, and Ariel Clark. Thank you so much. Did you know... 
that over 100,000 people in America are dying on an annual basis due to prescription medications. Yet marijuana has been around for 10,000 years and used as a medical resource and has never been known to kill a human being ever. But yet we're not utilizing this great medication. Here at Karma's Holistic Health Foundation, it is our sole purpose to get you to your medicine as quickly as possible, all while following the state of Nevada's laws. Please call us today and we will get you your medical marijuana card at 702-388-1119, 702-388-1119, or visit us online at getmedicalmarijuananow.com. Thank you. The Vaughn Dank Group offers turnkey solutions for all your cannabis needs, bringing transparency and responsibility to a young budding industry. Helping patients by producing the cleanest, safest, and most potent medicines and infusibles possible. The Von Dank Group is a design, management, and consulting corporation with over 30 years of industry experience and knowledge of the dispensary, edibles, infusible kitchen, and large-scale cultivation of cannabis manufacturing facilities. Let the Von Dank Group help you grow your cannabis business from seed to green. www.vondank.com this is the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Call us with your questions at 731-1230. Now, here again, your hosts, Michael McAuliffe and Jen Solis. All right, we're back once again. And I'd like to uh, talk a few minutes about something which uh, uh, just hit the wires yesterday, that the federal government signs off on a study using cannabis to treat veterans' PTSD. Uh, This is reported by the Associated Press, and the federal government uh, has signed off on this long-delayed study looking at cannabis as a treatment for veterans. Uh, And it's a shift that drug researchers are hailing as a major shift in U.S. policy. In a letter last week, the Health and Human Services uh, Department uh, cleared the purchase of medical cannabis by the study's chief financial backer, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, which supports medical research and legalization of cannabis and other drugs. So they've been trying to get this uh, through for 22 years. Wait, and- Michael, I just heard you say that the U.S. government has purchased marijuana? Well, is that the, the truth? Have they purchased cannabis? Well, no, it, no, it's it's a it's actually it's a private concern that is purchasing cannabis from the U.S. government. So the U.S. government is selling marijuana. Oh, I knew they were big drug dealers. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's the way it goes. Now, I personally, I think this is a, is a great move forward because uh, no group is more deserving of our compassion and our assistance than the veterans who have served, who've put it all on the line for us, es- any, any veteran of any era. But it seems even the more so now between Iraq and Afghanistan, where we're sending people out for seven, eight, nine tours. Uh, I... I ran into one gentleman who recently got out of the military after a full career. He had 16 deployments. How does that not scar you tremendously? And so these people are are protecting our freedoms, and so we have to get out there and do everything we can. Here on the state level, uh, our friend Dr. David Udy uh, got the PTSD recently added by the State Division of Health as the first new condition uh, in the program in its 13-year existence. And Yay, it's, Dr. Udy! Uh, yeah, shout out to Dr. Udy there. And it, it's all because we're, we want to take care of the veterans, and when you put it that way, it, it's uh, the, the wall of bureaucratic, bureaucratic opposition seems to, seems to crumble to some degree. So, you know, uh, they're protecting our freedom, so we need to protect their health. And, and Victoria, and during the break, you were mentioning freedom and, and how important it is. Yeah, absolutely. And um, that's why this is so important, the medical marijuana, and that people can choose their own medication. And if it's going to help with PTSD, you know, that is going to be absolutely wonderful. Um, I wanted to mention, too, we have so many conflicting federal and state laws. And this is a big problem because, you know, what might what might be a law in, in, in Nevada is federally illegal. So I don't know how we can, um, you know, we should be we should be, um, up, I mean, uh, using our 10th Amendment rights in the state where we should be able to create our own 
laws and certain things. And I, I just think this is a real problem with uh, federal law trumping state law. Uh, I, I agree. And the the 10th Amendment claim, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ariel, uh, is, is something not that an individual would use against the no. government, but it's, it's something, something that, that a state, state would use right. once the government is is uh, usurping the state's rightful Absolutely. authority. And uh, we were speaking uh, just before the broadcast saying that the Uniform Control Substances Act, which schedules cannabis as Schedule 1, uh, is a, a federal law designed to combat illicit narcotics, whereas, uh, and that's a criminal justice issue, whereas uh, health issues are under the state purview, which is why we have 50 different rollouts of the ACA. And, and by carefully crafting a really tight regulatory measure, and bravo, Michelle, uh, what we have done is, in a legal term, occupied the field and not given the feds room to come in on this. What are, what are your thoughts, Ariel? Well, that is one of the wonderful things about this program is be, or the meeting the Nevada Medical Marijuana Program is if we look at, for example, um, on August 29th, the Cole memo, quote unquote, Cole memo came it out. It was a birthday gift um, to me. Yes. Well, happy <laughs> birthday. <laughs> um, wherein the federal government was actually responding to Cal- Colorado and Washington and states with legalization, but also this um, relates to states with medical marijuana and basically saying, look, this is an issue that we would leave to the local and state government. So if you have a robust regulatory system we and, and oversight by the state government, which we do here, um, then we will leave that alone. Providing you're not selling the kids, you don't have gangs involved, That's and various right. things like that. Exactly. There, there are eight exactly. qualifiers. Well, which are very rational you know, priorities for the federal government to still look at. Yes, gang involvement, you know, that you have guns. Well, then we spoke about that issue earlier. I mean, that's... Mm-hmm. that's a, a problematic thing that re- remains, you know, about a year or so ago, the clarification of the Controlled Substances Act that if you are a medical marijuana user, then you cannot um, own a firearm. Yes, yes. And, th- and that is a, a big issue. And I think it's, I, I think it, it is more important in a, in a state like Nevada, especially where there's such wide open spaces and perhaps uh, the community and, and law enforcement can't respond in a really timely fashion as, as compared to if you're in a, a big city with, with 8 million other people, half of whom have guns and are drunk. Um, so, you know, uh, certainly I can, I can see the use for it over here. One, one of the big issues, and talking about guns and crime and everything, one of the big issues uh, that is being grappled with right now, uh, and we're seeing changes coming out of the Department of Justice, are in banking. We have uh, a federal prohibition against uh, any financial institutions working with uh, the medical cannabis industry, and I know of a um, uh, of one institution here in Nevada that's going to start working with some of these businesses when they're licensed, and it's a local institution, very brave. Is there something that you, Michelle, or, or you know, presuming that you get elected, Victoria, can do in the legislature to ease that burden and make it safer for everybody so they don't have to carry such large sums of cash? Yes, we actually write the laws for the state of Nevada, so wow. we should. Uh, that's what we do as a, as a member of the legislature, as a legislator. Um, and what we need to do, just as they've scheduled medical marijuana to be insane, we can go back and get elected officials to say, fix it. Rewrite the bill, amend the bill, and pass the bill. I mean, our first day in session... We passed online gaming like this, went to two houses and back like in a second. So let me tell you, when we're motivated to to fix and change something, we can do it. So you just have to get on the legislators and say, this is what the people want. Do it. Well, there's a saying in Nevada, don't mess with gaming. (laughs) <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it, it, of course that's going to get through. Uh, but, you know, I, I know that in, in conjunction with the CSA, um, that the states also schedule drugs and, and to, to some degree, not, maybe not every state. Uh, so could we, uh, you know, and you're shaking your head, no, Jen, I, I've seen this no. in different states. Well, no? no, I mean, the DEA covers any scheduled drugs. The Controlled Substance Act of 1970 controls uh, the, the scheduled drugs. The next uh, step down would be the State Board of Pharmacy, and they have oversight over those scheduled drugs. N- they don't reschedule. They, you don't reschedule something on a on a federal le- uh, on a federal controlled on a state list. on a state level. Yeah. No. Okay. 
Okay. You know, but, but speaking of the State Board of Pharmacy, one of the things that came into this bill was um, uh, creating a, a new oversight authority for doctors who recommend medical cannabis to patients in the state uh, with the idea that if a doctor recommends too many, that they're going to be subject to progressive levels of discipline by this new board. And Jen and I have both spoken with, with physicians in the state who say, wow, we've already got plenty of oversight you know, why do we need more? And, and it's going to have a, a chilling effect on our, our recommending this substance, which is safer than what we're limited to right now. Well, and their own their own oversight committees are actually harsher on them than any laws are because they're afraid of the censure of their of the oversight committee more than they're afraid of the law because the censure can can fine them and and take away their license or um, the state can just charge them and recommend that they go to be censured. So why do you think that was included, Michelle? I have to tell you, as, a, as a, a person in the healthcare industry, the whole reason that I got involved with politics was frustration and anger because we are heavily regulated. And I am talking about, I have an in-home healthcare agency that is unskilled, so I don't even change a Band-Aid. And we have as much regulation sometimes as a skilled agency, and it's not okay. So when I started looking at who was implementing these laws, these people that are implementing these laws have never changed an adult diaper, have never changed a Band-Aid, don't know what the heck they're doing, but they're going with the flow. And, and that is not okay. So I feel for these doctors because as, a, as a, a, a provider here in the state of Nevada, we get audited four or five times a year unannounced. They just come in the, off, the office and audit our files, audit this, audit that. And then if we're not in compliance, they take our provider number away and we're out of business. So... I got involved to make adjustments and changes and say, you know, why are we implementing this? What's happening here? And again, when you look at different aspects of the laws, it all comes back down to Washington, D.C., and they want to get um, the grant money and the federal money in the states to match. So in order for that to do, then they change our state laws to match Washington laws, and, and that's a big issue. We, we were actually, when we were in Pahrump this morning at the Nye Commission, one of the items that came up uh, before uh, the medical cannabis item was uh, the commission adopt, uh, passing a, a resolution to, uh, to apply for the burn grants once again. And the burn grants are uh, a, a federal program which uh, funds narcotics officers, and essentially gives extra money and bonuses the more arrests you make. And it, it kind of reinforces uh, the, the, the police to make more arrests, even low-level arrests. It's just based on, on sheer numbers. And this county commissioner said, well, you know, uh, not that we need any more narcotics officers because the testimony was that there wasn't an increased drug problem there, but, you know, we pay our taxes to Washington, so any chance I get to get federal money back, I'm going to take it, and I'm always going to vote for that. And, and so here we have them voting to, uh, to fund uh, detectives for a problem that doesn't really exist and it's not I don't have anything against the police but I'd rather they be going after murderers and sexual predators and and you know that violent um, felons. The other point that I took issue with is that the person that was in charge of the oversight of the grants when they were asking her, well, where does this money go and, and where did it go in the last year? And she's up there to testify in front of the county commission. You know what her answer was? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, shock. That's exactly what my job did. I went, what? Wait, you're in charge of knowing where this money goes and the oversight of these grants, and you're coming here to talk to fed, you know, to your state officials or your, or your county officials about this, and you have no documentation about where this money goes? Mm. And I don't know was an acceptable answer. Yeah. So we're getting ready to wrap up. But before we do, Michelle, uh, let me ask for, for people who are interested in your in your very libertarian sort of Republican views. Uh, um, how, how do they get a hold of you? How do they take a look at your campaign and, and maybe help? Yeah, well, that would be great. Um, so my name is Michelle Fiore. I'm your assemblywoman for District 4. You can go to my website, which is michellefiore.com. And Michelle is spelled with one L. Or you can call me at 702-210-8460. And Victoria, how about you? Yes, I'm Victoria Seaman running for Assembly District 34. And my website is Victoria Seaman, S-E-A-M-A-N, 
com, or you can email me at victoria at victoriaseaman.com. And Ariel, Ariel, I'm sure there are a lot of people who want to get into the medical <laughs> cannabis business. How do they get a hold of you? Well, you can go to my website, which is my first name, Ariel, and my last name, Clark.com, A-R-I-E-L-C-L-A-R-K, Dot com or Ariel at arielclark.com and I'm certainly happy to speak with any about one about this exciting new industry. And Michael, thank you so much. My pleasure. And Jen, thank you. Thank you, Michael. All right. So uh, we're closing up and we will have uh, another edition next week. Our expected guest is going to be Sheriff Candidate Ted Moody. So join us then and keep fighting. Keep fighting.